Welcome back. It's been a little while since our last episode, but we're keeping the Rob and Eritrea show going. We know you guys really like this episode or these episodes, and we love doing them. So it's it's kind of an interesting balance between, yes, we are going to continue to tell the amazing stories of people with diabetes from all over the world, but also you guys have developed relationships with us over the years, and we love that. So shout out to our our like day one hype squad type people who... <laughs> you know, just keep us gassed on social media. So thank you guys for all of the messages and comments and mailbag emails, which we're going to get into today for the first time. Very excited to dig into those. So again, like, thank you guys to the community. We are nothing without you guys. We are nothing without our loyal supporters. No, but you know, it's been a little bit over a month. I think we were just talking about how May and how 2023 has been like flying by and so much has happened and may just kind of got away from us so for those of you who thought think again because we're back <laughs> you thought uh, you thought I've always, um, I've always wanted to say you thought but now now i, I got to so thank you for that you set me up <laughs> you're welcome welcome come to the barbecue but uh, yeah no it's just the month got away from us and i think we have event update i mean it just we literally just right before we started this i think people forget that we're also friends but like we were just talking about how crazy it was that the event that we did at Pax and Beneficia was 45 days ago. Yeah, like today's May 30th at the time of recording. So that was April 15th. And it doesn't seem that long ago, you know, but at the same time, you know, man, 45 days goes by quick. So yeah, shout out to everybody who came. I On our previous episode, we were talking about like, you guys see the videos, you guys see like the followers and like the sponsor deals or whatever. And it's like, oh, you know, we live this like privileged celebrity lifestyle. And I was like, no, like we're still just trying to get eight people to come to an event. And we had like over 20 people there. They were all super awesome. Uh, It was so great to meet each one of them. And I just am reminded that you never know like who's going to show up for you. And like, you never know who's out there listening. So keep creating. And I'm just grateful for everybody that showed up. We had a great time. Shout out to Paxton Beneficia. They taught us how to make coffee, how they roast it. They taught us how to make, you know, beautiful latte art. And it was just a cool, a cool way to spend a couple of hours. And right before the event, it was so funny. Like we were waiting for people to get there because we got there early. And this <laughs> kid with an Omnipod, like is waiting for a coffee, like at the counter. And Eritrea went up to him. He was probably like 17. And like Eritrea went up to him and was like, hey, are you here for the event? And he was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, I just imagine, and I don't know what it is, but lately I, I can't, I don't know what it is, but like at the mall, I went to the mall on Saturday. I saw like a tall, athletic, like strong dude wearing a Dexcom. And I was like, damn, like, who is this guy? <laughs> and, you know, I saw uh, we volunteered. We had a service day at Recreation Dallas. There was a woman at the food bank who had a Freestyle Libre on. And so it's just like people are di- with diabetes are out there. And, you know, if you if you look on the backs of arms, typically you can find you can find some people out. So that was uh, that was cool. I don't know. So all, all that to say, our first event is is in the books. We're going to talk a little bit more later about what's coming and the future events. So uh, just looking forward to connecting and seeing you guys all in, in, in real life, in person, very soon. While we're talking about connecting, I think there's an immense amount of value to meeting other people with diabetes. And sometimes I find myself like, oh, I, I know so many people with diabetes because I do. And then an issue will come up. Like I'm writing an article for a diatribe about skin rashes and like your CGMs. And a young lady that I met at the event, who's a longtime listener of the pod, Emily Peterson, she DM'd me back and was like, this and this and this about skin rashes and Dexcom and a bunch of stuff that I didn't even know about. Honestly, she had DM'd me so much stuff that I was like, I have to sit down and read all this because there's just so much information. But I guess you've said it before, but I just want to double down that a friend with diabetes is like a friend indeed. And you can meet them at our Diabetes Diabetics Doing Things events. So come to the next one because... Yeah, I cannot, I cannot wait to announce these officially. We'll, oh, I guess we'll officially reveal them here on the pod, but... Yeah, we're we're just we're doing some cool stuff, and again, just like it, just to meet people with diabetes, and also to bring something cool and fun for people who have been to meetups and might just want to do something different or or learn how to do something new or just have a good afternoon to put something on the books to do. Yeah, that allows you to feel good about diabetes for a change. So just excited to continue to do that. We are cool. We do cool stuff. Hang out with us. <laughs> yeah and just you know come be our friend for the afternoon well speaking of being friends for the afternoon and doing cool stuff you recently so you put out this video that first of all i, I was just dying laughing because you had this huge microphone and you were doing like a rob on the street thing walking up to people being like what does your pancreas do i can't imagine how many crazy answers you got that didn't make the video 
there so i'll give you guys some more like feedback on that so that is a sponsored video i'm doing with medtronic so i went out ashley actually was filming so uh shout out to shout ashley out. For, for like going out in a very hot april day and, and filming on the street and i gotta be honest like sometimes i get you know pitch content stuff that i do not want to do <laughs> and i did not want to go do this and Shout out to the Medtronic team because they encouraged me and like we worked on this cool thing and it was actually like really cool. It turned out really well and I got some cool answers. There's actually more to the video that's coming. Oh. A surprising amount of people, like just like we kind of know, like people don't know anything about your pancreas or insulin or diabetes or really anything at all. So it's just a lot of work to be done. And I know we talk a lot about stigma and we talk, you know, in the diabetes community, I think it's very like top of mind, like we want to be seen, we want to be accepted. But the first part of that is information. And also there's just like 40 to 50 years of mass media misinformation about diabetes out there that people don't realize is misinformation. But also diabetes isn't on like the top five things that you cover in health class. Like you, you know, you cover the heart, you cover the brain. Pancreas pretty far down the list, even though that one in three Americans at this point, like live with some sort of diabetes. So I definitely think that there's an opportunity to increase that, but yeah, anyway, it was, it was crazy to see people were actually more giving than I thought. Like I was like, no one's going to want to answer these questions and people wanted to, they were, it was, it was cool. They were excited. So I think I'm going to do some more of those when we go to bigger events or when I just like go to concerts or, or, or sports events or something. And yeah. there's a lot of people around I might just pop in and do a couple of more of those. Cause it was a lot of fun. I think and this isn't our, and I'm going to go off of our agenda because yes this podcast do have an agenda but something you said just like really piqued my interest over a conversation i had this weekend i was watching that movie me before you you before me it's the one about the paraplegic guy you mr rom-com amelia clark paraplegic guy they fall in love whatever the point is they go to like this dinner party and someone at the dinner party tells him he's like i've heard of these workouts that you can do to like fix your paraplegia like this person is fully just and it was mm. this moment of me like the conversation I was having with the person I was watching the movie was when I was like, that is so harmful. Those types of comments happen all the time in diabetes and people don't understand how those types of comments like lead to access issues and like just not understanding of the disease and what you think might be a very like, oh, I'm just trying to help with my take some cinnamon, take some celery juice, try this treatment. It really perpetuates a narrative of so of like violence toward people with diabetes and I don't know if that was just me being dramatic so I kind of wanted to bring it to you now just because that's what you made me think of with this talking to people on the street it's like their commentary and just how little they knew made me feel like I, I will say I, I benefit greatly from being very abled looking and I mean abled I mean I'm nice at whatever you know like I'm good like you know what I'm saying like, <laughs> don't, like I, I have I, I can, exa you know, I, I used to make jokes when I was doing comedy about how I'm like the poster child for white privilege because I could just like walk in anywhere and everybody just thinks I belong and like this, you know, most things are catered to me. And I also have a lot of confidence and, you know, I'm a pretty, I try to be a good listener. So I'm like contextually aware of what's going on a lot. So again, I get to skirt a lot of problems around stigma and like advice because I think I just have enough confidence that people don't feel the need to give me advice. Now, that still does happen from time to time. And I, we've talked about it on this podcast, but I, I want to come back. Like you said, it was violence towards people. And I, and I think it is. And I think the, the challenge too is when someone is giving you unsolicited advice and then you acknowledge that and you kind of go back to them and they don't hear you, you know, they're not really interested in hearing the dialogue or having a discussion. They're really just like, no, this worked for me and it'll work for you. Like, you should just do it. Like, why haven't you done it? And I, I think there was a recent video that the hangry woman, Mila Clark Buckley, posted, a friend of the pod, Mila Clark Buckley, or I just sorry, Mila Clark, excuse me, oh. up the, the, the new era, the Mila Clark era. She posted like a conversation she was having in the comments with someone who was like giving her unsolicited diabetes advice. And she was like breaking it down for them pretty scientifically. and. They weren't, she wasn't making any progress. So like, you're not going to change somebody's mind in your comments. I learned that a long time ago. Mm -hmm. uh, 
you just can't like they're not they're not they're not going to be receptive to that most of the time so it's sort of a waste of energy is how i i see it now especially people that you don't know um and like you said like you'll get these comments whenever you use like the diabetes hashtag sometimes or just randomly of like oh this doctor helped me dr umar helped me with this yeah it's just a lot and i feel like and i I think this was like my larger feeling around the conversation because the person i was talking to was like very adamant about well, the person's well-intentioned. They're trying to, like, meet you where you are. And I'm just, like, I'm not very nice about it. I think every, the people who listen to this podcast have kind of gotten to know my personality. And I am very, like, no, I'm the, I'm the one. I am the last person you're going to do this to. Because I think that it's not only harmful, but it perpetuates the narrative that people with diabetes have done something to cause this to happen right. to them. That they are deserving of this life of chronic illness. And I just be like, no. And even if I'm not very nice to you about it, you're going to learn some today. So it's just, I'm tired of it. And if you are out spouting unsolicited advice, like, please don't run into me because I'm going to hurt your feelings. And maybe that's not the right way to go about it. So, you know, I need some Rob Grace in my life. But I'm just, I don't know. I just no, well, I- well, don't get me wrong. I don't have Grace sometimes about it either. Sometimes you catch me on the wrong day. I got a quick trigger sometimes on. And, you know, I have a, you know, I am who I am. And my family some of the the i got amazing traits for my family but one of the traits that i also got is like a really whip sharp silver tongue and i can say some really hurtful stuff like pretty quick off the dome which allowed me to survive uh being a overgrown stretched out middle schooler pretty well <laughs> but you know it can be very hurtful and i think you know i try to now be more mindful of like not responding that way but to your point i i think a lot of times, and I, I, I'm just going to give these people commenters, like in your example from this rom-com, that person is trying to relate somehow to that person and talk about some shared interest. Unfortunately, most people can only focus on like what's in front of them. And so, hey, like, you know what this disabled person probably wants to talk about? Their disability. Like, let's just go in. And again, like I also see on the other side, like on the internet, especially, I'm opting in to sharing my life with diabetes. Like I am, am choosing to be a diabetes blogger and podcaster and, and advocate. So like I'm, I'm making myself open to that. And I think that's what I would just tell anybody who's trying to be like in, in content creation is like part of what you want is more people to see you. So the more people they will see you, eventually there'll be people that are like, fuck you, man. Like, sorry, sorry, parents. For for just you know, I was so it. proud of you. I avoided saying that. Um, but that's what I wanted to say. So you know, you know, like again, like there's just a lot of people, and I think there's also, and we'll talk about this a little bit more later. A lot of people with diabetes, and so diabetes is not a monolith. People are not a monolith. There's going to be some people out there. There's some people out of diabetes out there with diabetes that are pieces of shit. Yeah. Um, just because like so many people have it, it's just how it goes. So. I think like if somebody's coming at you, like don't, it's, it says more about them than it does you. And I think a lot of people probably mean well, and they just don't have the, you know, awareness to, to do it in, in a nice way. But that's actually is a great transition into the next segment that you had on your outline, which is like diabetes, drama, drama, yes. drama, drama, yes. drama, drama. Like there's so much <laughs> da- drama around diabetes that has nothing to do with carb counting and the insulin dosing, pumps, CGMs, whatever the case. And it's all about being on the phone with your insurance company, unsolicited comments on the internet from strangers, brushing your teeth and getting that low blood sugar alarm and having to go drink orange juice and you have that terrible taste in your mouth. I used to think like, I have this funny like prompt, I'm going to turn into a real one of these days. It's like, do I have diabetes distress or am I just having to eat peanut butter after I already brushed my teeth? I think yeah. I made a real like that where it's like, am I depressed or is my blood sugar just high? <laughs> yeah. It's, it, and like all of those things are contribute to the drama around diabetes, you know, prior authorizations, new insurance companies, Ugh. like jo- asking questions in job interviews that you don't get a good answer to. All of these things like contribute to the drama around diabetes. And I wanted to highlight that because I think one people, one thing people love, no matter who you are or where you come from is drama. And Diabetes has a lot of that, and I think it's just a good way of kind of introducing people to the stuff that they don't see or that they don't know about behind the scenes for someone living with a chronic illness. You mentioned a few, so I think you mentioned like the ones that are the most known because you posted an Instagram box, like a question box, and you're like, what is the drama that you are experiencing like on a regular basis as a person with diabetes? 
And I think one of my favorites, a lot of my favorite ones was like the justifying your diabetes even after your diagnosis is never changing. Like that is so annoying when I have to like submit documentation to like a new insurance company where my doctor who have had the same endocrinologist for ever is like, yeah, she still has this chronic lifelong disease. Like it was, it was so funny to me when like the whole, the whole time in like diabetes education, they teach you like, you didn't do anything to cause this, you know, it's going to last forever. And then the first time that happened to me, you know, a year and a half into my life with diabetes, I laughed. I thought it was funny. I was like, they like, they told me that it wasn't curable. Are you telling me different? You know, like, because <laughs> I'm listening. So like, I, I think that, yeah, it's just annoying. And again, like the, you're literally having to advocate and create diabetes awareness along every step of the journey all the way through. And that's, it's just really challenging. And I think especially on a bad day or when your blood sugar is out of range or where you just are feeling tired of it. You, you know, you can, you can come t- sometimes like snap at someone or, you know, you can make a video on the internet. You do that? That's actually something I was going to ask you is like, do you snap because of your diabetes? I don't know. Maybe you well, not, not, as, not, not as much recently. I think <laughs> when I was, but I used to tell this story, I think I've told it on the pod before. One of my teammates asked me a really innocuous, like simple question about my diabetes test kit, my first year of college. And I like bit his head off. Like, and, and, you know, cursed at it, like direct, like really mean. And I think it was like, I, I felt like it, he was pointing out something wrong with me and he was genuinely just curious and was like a really nice guy. And like we squashed, you know, I, I apologized to him later and we were friends after that. But yeah, like it can feel really othering when yeah. somebody asks even a simple question if you're having a bad day with diabetes. And so, yeah, I, I used to do that. I used to have a quicker temper and I think as I'm getting older, I'm just, I'm, I'm a little bit less, less reactive. Well, yeah, something you said earlier, you were, when we were talking about the people saying stuff and who your family has made you to be, it's like my favorite Amin Musa comment or quote ever is, it is absolutely free to shut up. Like, you don't have to say anything to me about my diabetes at yeah. all. And I didn't ask. I think, I think that's the thing is like, have confidence when people are coming at you, like, just to be like, honestly, man, like, I just didn't ask for this. Like, I'm, I'm good on the advice. Thank you. But like, but I'm good. Keep it. I love her talking about drama. I feel like that's the overlying, like the theme of today's episode. And I really want to get into this JDRF drama. Yeah. So everything I come across, like on JDRF drama on social media is sort of against my will. And (laughs) You know, I always feel like their social team is full of like really kind, like cool people who are trying to do the right thing. Mm-hmm. And when they do that, especially over the weekend, outside of like normal work hours, the community that of the people that follow them, there is a contingent of that community that is really toxic. Oh, yeah. And I think... We need to just acknowledge it publicly that, and I have screenshots of the post because they oh, did a, a, a really, a really, well, I sent them to you, but the, the, uh, the post was about complications. And so I'm here to say right now, Corey, turn the camera on. We're going to do this video. I'm here to say that life with diabetes does not end happily. Like at some point you and I are going to die from diabetes complications, even if we're old even if we've lived this beautiful long life, and I hope we do, but no matter what we do, we have type one diabetes, diabetes mellitus. And we're going to deal with complications, whether that's, you know, calluses on our fingers from finger sticks, whether that's irritation from CGM tape or pump tape, whether that's hypolipertrophy from insulin injections or, or insulin sites, or neuropathy in our eyes, in our feet, in our teeth, in gums. You know, all of these things, like, we could lose our eyes. We we can lose our feet. You know, the people we were talking about earlier with the unsolicited advice always know about which family members of theirs had amputations. And so I'm here to tell you that if you are perpetuating someone's value as a person with diabetes based on how they appear as a whole-bodied individual, as an able-bodied individual, you are trash. So let it go, you know, and I think a lot of it, unfortunately, is parents of and caregivers of people with diabetes who are trying and want the best, I think, for the best intentions and for the best reasons, want their kids to live a complication-free life. And I hope that they do. 
But the reality is that when we get taken off and when they scrape us off this mortal plane, we are going because of diabetes one way or the other. And so let it go. If somebody, somebody had some, you know, and a lot of times it's during our teen years, we had elevated A1Cs and 30 years later, we, you know, have neuropathy in our, in some of our small blood vessels. And that doesn't make you less than. So and people see that. I think people with diabetes who are experiencing complications and are supporters of causes like JDRF, myself included, see those comments and say, wow, this isn't a welcome space for me uh, because you know, I, I now am looking at this. It's something that I now wanted. I was celebrating these people who were brave enough to like post pictures of themselves getting their eyes dilated, trying to go through the proper treatment. These are like, this is on label treatment for people with diabetes that mm -hmm. is being stigmatized in the comments by people who think that it's reflective on their care and or the that that's any of their business. There was one where the lady was like, as a mom to a newly diagnosed child, this makes me sick to my stomach. And then the rest of her comment is, please tell me the comments about keeping low carb diets helping is true. And I felt irate. Like I was, I can imagine being, maybe it's because I was diagnosed as a small kid, but I can't imagine being eight years old and everyone at my table being fed a meal and my mom making me eat like zucchini noodles because I can't have pasta. Like I, I'm angry for that child. Like it's, it's not well, right. And, and I'll give that person a little grace because they were, they're new. They're new. It's, so, but that's my whole thing. It's like, she's being so, introduced to this, this toxic place. So I think it's really important how we onboard people into the diabetic experience because right off the bat, my parents were no different. We were like, okay, well, my kid is going to be exceptional. We're not going to, that, that may be true for some other people, but we are in control of what we eat, how we treat, that kind of rhymes. And, and like what we do about it. So, hey, it's, 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 that's going to happen to somebody else. That's true for somebody else, not for me, not for my kid. And I think that's, that pressure is so subjective. You know, you, there are people with 5.7 A1Cs their entire lives who have neuropathy, who have difficult diabetes complications because diabetes is a monolith, because everyone is different. Diabetes is not a monolith, rather. Everyone is different. And a ton of different people have it. So I think what it really sucks is that I'm looking at the, you know, the personal account of the people who are, are in the post going in and saying like, man, I'm sitting here reading these comments about people. I had the courage to share during a very specific part of the year as part of this content theme to share my patient journey. And you're just belittling me and saying that you hope this never happens to someone else. Of course they hope it doesn't happen, but it is a reality of diabetes. And, you know, I think that, that those uncomfortable parts of diabetes we need to continue to talk about, not just from avoidance, but also from acceptance. Because if you have, have lost an eye or a limb or you know, anything because of diabetes, like think of that, how that person feels. They don't, they didn't want that. You know, they didn't do that on purpose. You know, of course not. And even if they had like, you know, part of their story is a cautionary tale of like, you know, they're giving them of themselves to say, Hey, I, I did this wrong. And I hope you don't do it this way. It's, you know, not so that you guys can just pile on about low carb and what, whatnot. You know, I think that's the, uh, that's a really uncomfortable part about the diabetes online community is that there are these sects and there are these groups that are only looking for a specific type of diabetes to celebrate. Yep. And that's and harmful I'm and it's dangerous. I think, first of all, I'm somebody who lives with a diabetic macular edema. Like what they're talking about in the post specifically is people like me. And I was just like, oh, this is cool. Maybe I want to post the picture of my eye because that's scary. But I can see why they did it. It's for visibility, for awareness. And then it was a good, I, want, I want to say it's a good post. I, the comments tripped me out. And I think what also, and it's kind of a pairing of the two, right? Because I think like I live as a person with diabetes, so I have experiences every day. And then I see something like this and I'm like, what the hell? But I was reading or I was writing an article about the fear of hyperglycemia. So like parents and how it impacts them with their kids. And it's so interesting to me that there's all these parents in the comments talking about low carb diets and this and that were in this article that I wrote. The research shows that most parents are actually afraid of hypoglycemia. They spend most of their time saving their kid from low, from lows because that's imminent danger. And we're not thinking about the hyperglycemia and all those effects. And while you do think about it, that's a problem for another day, right? And then these people who are dealing with the problem now 
are being met with those same parents in the comments being like, no, 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 like not my kid. I don't know. It was just, I felt like a dog chasing my own tail. Like I was just like, what is this? It's so backwards how we understand diabetes as a whole and as a community. So I think it is important for us to talk about how damaging commentary like that can be to people's experiences and how invalidating it is. Like you didn't do anything wrong. You just have a complication because you've had diabetes for some time or because you have diabetes and that's okay. Yeah. And it's tough. I, I, it's tough to accept. I think that's another thing about diabetes is just requires a certain level of maturity and it's something that cannot be explained in a social media comment or a social media post all at once, you know? And I think, yeah, it's, it's just, and yeah, it is scary and yeah, it is gross. Like, of course it is. Like, you don't think you think everybody chose this on purpose, you know, like you think those people want Matt, you think you want macular degeneration? You think like, that that's si something like sign me up for this? I don't know. Also, I, I kind of wonder, maybe it's because we're different types of human beings. Maybe we're content creators and not commenters. I don't know. You're still like a commenter, but I'm a professional think... commenter, to be honest. Yeah. I'm, one of the, I'm one of the best there is. Best in the game. OK, if you say so. But my point is, I could never see and I'm pretty rash and confrontational and all that stuff. But I could never see myself typing something out like this is their fault. And that's like there's comments like that. Like, I just can't believe how. What pedestal? How dare you? Like, I, I, I would like to quote. I would like to quote episode nine of our recently departed beer show succession, which is, uh, there is a sort of a meagerness in men that when you say I'm warm and I and this other person is cold, and I think that that's okay, and that's, gr you know, Grandpa you and talking about Logan mm -hmm. at the funeral. Sorry, spoilers. Mm -hmm. So. I think that there really is, a, it, and all of that is fear based. Yeah. Which is like, hey, as long as, you know, me and my family are good, like, cool, you guys do whatever you want. Like, and I think that that is a real societal challenge more than it is about diabetes is that, like, oh, well, you know, we have to be protected from the outside world and these people that, you know, are, are different than us or, or are less, less well off. You know, I just, I don't see it that way, but that, that is a real, problem i think and and causes a lot of things outside of just this discussion and you know i don't want to do 20 more minutes on this but you know I, I think it is it's important to call out that like we have a lot of work to do and all of us who are involved in our diabetes communities when you hear commentary from people who are on committees or people who are working on events or people who you know and you see them saying things like like you said in the comment like you know i i don't want me and my family to have this or this looks really ugly or this is really bad I think we need to have conversations with them in a different form outside of the comments and say, hey, like, let me help you understand like why this is damaging or like why I don't agree with, with this. And, and I think that that kind of drama, none of us signed up for. And, but, you know, when we're talking about like a community of advocates, like, are we all advocating for the right things? And, you know, is there a double-edged sword to, to some of this internet advocacy where, you know, you're just going from, you know, a, a pretty simple post to, you know, having to defend like people's right to be seen and be visible, even if they're not the perfect display of, of a of a human, you know, or not the most complete archetype for what a person should look like. And I think the last thing I'll say is the bright side of complications is not not complications. Like as a person living with diabetes, you don't get to be like, it's totally possible to not live with complications. Is it possible? Yes. Nobody asked you. It's free. You already know that. Like, be quiet. So I just think that like also adding like even if you're not an advocate, even if you're not a commentator, even if you don't have anything to say that is actually going to help the conversation move forward, like saying things like that, like I feel like just makes it worse because there's a lot of good intention people who were like, we can also say that a lot of people living with type one have a healthy life. We know that. Thank you. Have a nice day. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, you know, again, it's hard to change people's minds in the comments. Mm -hmm. uh, OK, we're so we're not going to do it today. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So anyway, let's I, talk about I your diabetes speaking. Okay. Of. Yeah, let's do it. Well, <laughs> big updates. At the beginning of this month, May 1st, the FDA approved Medtronic 780G in the US and the Guardian 4 sensor. So I'm very excited. I've been waiting on that two years. I can't share this, you know, with the specifics with you guys, but I've seen the research from Europe and Asia and Africa on people's time and range as a result of this compared to the control people that like don't even bolus and get you know a very good time and range that i think anybody would be happy with and they're not even bolusing they're just letting the algorithm do the work 
I've been waiting on it for a number of years and I'm just excited that it's here. So I'm in the process of upgrading my 770 to the 780. And don't worry, they've got me doing a lot of content for it. So uh, there'll be a I'm lot of- I'm actually excited. I'm, I, I'm not a Medtronic head and I'm not paid by them. So I could, I'm really excited about your content because my, the, the rumor that I heard is that the pump can tell when you're eating food, even if you don't bowl it. So like there's like this sensor or something. I don't know, you guys can Google it. This is what I learned from the internet that like sees when you move your hands towards your mouth to eat, which is So like even snacky. That's crazy. So I'm not a Medtronic person and I'm kind of regretting getting another pump this year because I'm like this thing, this. So I'm excited to see your content and to learn more about 780G and see what else Medtronic has in store. Like, I don't mean to be a stand right now, but y'all got a seven day infusion set and you got this new pump. I don't have to oh, put that, on and, <laughs> and that seven day infusion set video popped off. It almost did like 30K on, on Instagram. So that was cool. Not surprised. It's really, it's really exciting stuff for people living with diabetes who have to wear these devices and that need an AID system, like a hybrid closed loop system. And if this is as close as we're getting, the technology advances this last month have been very exciting. So exciting stuff for you and exciting stuff for me because I get to watch. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, like I, I'm, I took that pump break last year. I'm back on the pump and I have been for, you know, over six months and my numbers are good. My, like the amount of time I think about diabetes is, you know, pretty good. I'm looking forward to it getting better on both fronts. And, you know, I, I think for me, it's a balance of like the tubed pump for me works. It allows me to do what I want to do. And the, you know, automated insulin delivery, hybrid closed loop system. It, I love that as well. So in, improved sensor, improved algorithm really cool stuff coming. And, you know, I'm excited to just like, you know, have a little bit less thought and a little bit more control over just the day to day. Oh my gosh. Can that, can you put that on a sweater? A little less thought and a little bit more control on the day to day. That is definition of the life that I would like to live. While we're talking about diabetes, you said earlier when we were having a friend to friend conversation, we we're talking about lows and you were telling me that you have a childhood story about, well, okay, so let me give you guys some background. I found myself eating gluten-free peanut butter, pretzels, and like apple juice in between meetings one day while I was really low. And I was really digging it. I was like, this is awesome. Like, I love having diabetes right now because I can just snack for no reason, even though the reason is that I'm low. So my question to you is going to be, what was your favorite low snack or what childhood low snacks did you really enjoy? Yeah, it's a good question. I think mostly I was pretty like, boring about my low snacks. I, I was an orange juice guy for a long yeah. time, but you know, the orange juice didn't have the protein. So I'd have to do a little peanut butter with it. You know how it goes. Yeah. yeah. You, know, you know, real pantry heads know what I'm saying. T1D pantry heads, you just <laughs> grab in the pantry for whatever's there. You know, I also did the, uh, like the nature's own bars were part of that. Cause they were like, you know, the carb counts were easy, like 22 carbs for the two of them. So I was like, okay, cool. He's such a healthy little white boy grabbing stuff from the pantry, talking about some orange juice and granola bars. Kill I mean, me, at, the, at the same time in college, one time I just treated a low with like sweet, sweet, sweet and spicy chili Doritos, dipping them in peanut butter. So like, I've definitely been on both sides of the <laughs> spectrum. So like, that's definitely part of it. But you asked like, do you ever enjoy your lows? And I think you were yeah. just talking about food. And what was funny is like early on in my life with diabetes at the end of high school, I had never like taken any mind altering drugs or alcohol. Like I had been like a totally sober person of like most 17 year olds, I guess. But Great edge, um, I know and like, you know, yeah, mostly just because it was not a lot of my school and I was a goody two shoes, but I felt like the first couple of times I had a low and I like felt it, I was like, okay, cool. I'm going to test. And I'm also just going to sit here for a little while. Cause like, I feel good. Like you kind of have that like euphoric, you know, haze a little bit of that, like low blood sugar, hypoglycemic haze. And so I would like sit there for like 10 or 15 minutes. And then like, I would go eat and correct it. Cause I like, you know, I knew it's dangerous. And I think, you know, that's, that's the thing about lows is like, and why I make the 69 jokes is because lows are scary. If there's something that you can like find that, is something like a little bit to feel good about or to laugh about. I think that's really important. But the other thing is, and we talked about this in our you know friend off the record before we turned on the the camera. Like a low blood sugar triggers a response in your brain to eat. That's why you get the low blood sugar munchies, and that's because your body's trying to survive. And when you do it, when you eat, it gives you so much dopamine. It's just like a cold tub. Like it's just like boom, like dopamine on the, on the rise. You're like, yes, more food, more of that, which is why we often get rebound highs because 
we're eating too much and it feels good. So yeah, the spicy, you know, sweet chili Doritos dipping in peanut butter. You're like, oh yeah, not only is this a really weird piece of food that I would probably never intentionally eat outside of this, outside of this medical response, it also feels good and tastes good. I'm going to keep going. I feel like I just learned something. Well, okay. We had talked before about the that weirdo thing that where you liked Lowe's because I had a friend who used to like to fall asleep while she was low because very similar to you. She was like very straight edge and she'd say that like it kind of gave her like a drunk feeling like mm-hmm. to feel low when we were like in high school and stuff. So I knew that, but I didn't know that your brain. So what, so what you're saying is just like to make sure I get it. Your brain when you're low is like feed me, feed me, feed me, not just because your blood sugar is low, but because also... I'm going to release a bunch of dopamine that's like, yeah. I can't speak to the, the the why. I think after you eat, like it's kind of like getting out of the cold water. It's like you're giving your body what it wants. It wants wow. the food. It's signaling you to eat. That's why people call, you know, call it like the drunk munchies. It does feel like that because you kind of have that like slow reaction time. You know, you're a little bit in the haze. Then you get some food and you're like, oh yeah, more of this. And that's when your brain's like, yes, hey, we need this. This is good. Uh, give us more. And, that, and so it gives you that dopamine reward. Punch the button. Give me more food. I like that. Hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. If I read an interesting book over the last, you know, since the last time we recorded about, it was called Dopamine Nation. It was really, really good. If you're interested in learning about like addiction and dopamine in your brain, and that I'd highly recommend that. Dopamine Nation. We'll put it in the show notes for you guys if you're interested. Yeah. Anything so, else happening? Go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say my my current favorite low snack. Right now, I, I'm just on the Haribo gummy bears. I just keep them in. I keep them in my little, uh, my stasher bag inside my diabetes bag. And it, it works great for me. It's medicinal, you know? Whatever, <laughs> man. I feel like you're not, you're not, but you're also one of those guys who's like, and I mean, if this is me making assumptions about you, please correct me. But why fix it if it's not broken type of vibe? Like if this I'm is very what works much for you. That, very much of that guy. Yeah. yeah if it ain't, you if like, it ain't broke, don't fix it. <laughs> you seem like the kind of guy you'd probably eat the same breakfast every single day because the carb counts are the same every day. Is that you? Oh my God. That's yeah. So I don't even eat breakfast, which is another thing that my, when I got on the hyper closed loop allowed me to do, mm-hmm. uh, you know, so I've been intermittent fasting for five years or so, but yeah, I mean, I'm just the type of guy. I used to say like diabetes really resonates with me because I could just do the same thing over and over and over and over and over and take you know pretty much not get bored with it. Me perpetually bored. So currently, I'm so since you're having the boring snack, I love Haribo going bears, but something about eating them in Germany like messed me up, and I'm just like I don't like these anymore. So I switched to fruit gushers, which have 18 carbs in one pack because I was like, bring out the eight year old in me. I like those. And then at Target last week. The Sonic the Hedgehog gummies were on sale because, girl, I'm on a budget now, apparently. And they were like three seventy five. dollars So that time to the cost, I was like, okay. And so I got two boxes. And those were really fun. So I've been switching it up on gummies. I've been trying to also incorporate like some peanut butter here and there or a protein or whatever. But I've also been doing this thing where <laughs> because I have hypo and awareness, I don't feel the low. So I just be taking my time with it. Like, be like, oh, now I'm low. Maybe I should eat lunch. I want to... Wanna... I'm glad you brought up hypo and awareness because I know you're on a panel uh, mm-hmm. this month with Diatribe with some pretty awesome people in it. And you were yes. kind of uh, the patient on the panel to talk about your perspective. Um, I experienced, you know, a little bit of, it w- 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 and what I will characterize it as a technology induced hypo and awareness, which is that when I'm not wearing a sensor, I am less in tune or, you know, I'm, I'm not as locked in on my feeling as I would be just like, oh, well, my device is going to alert me. So I kind of lose that muscle memory. Mm -hmm. And so it takes me a few hours, days of not wearing the sensor to really pick back up my, you know, my plug in with my body. And sometimes when I'm like in between sensors or sites or whatever, I'll just wait a couple of days. And it mostly is just because I'm kind of lazy sometimes. And I just like, don't feel like taking the two minutes to just put it on. But I don't know. I just, I was interested to see like how you would describe your hypo and awareness. Like, is it something that you just a hundred percent have to be alerted by, by your technology? Or if you've been a low a little while, are there any cues that you pick up on? Well, first of all, I think it's interesting that your technology induced hypo and awareness is literally the opposite of mine. So when I don't have a sensor or if I'm in between sensors or whatever, like I haven't gotten my package from the Lara. And if you know, you know, Ugh. Anyways, I'll be more 
like hyper vigilant, I guess, because it's like I have no safety net. Like I need to try to see if there's anything in my brain that tells me if I'm low. Um, but what I've noticed as far as still wearing my sensor and having everything that I need is if I've been having pretty good blood sugars for like a couple of days and suddenly I start to have a low, I'm going to feel that. I'm going to feel it way more than when my body is used to running at 80 to 95, 95, which is like my target blood sugar, what it used to be, right? Until I made some adjustments with my doctor to make my target blood sugar like 140 to 165. So I get some of those sensations now again, but it's not all the time. Sometimes I won't feel it at all. It just really depends on what the blood sugars have been like those last couple of days for me personally. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Th thank you for sharing that. I think it's really interesting, like how we all react a little bit differently to technology and alerts and things mm -hmm. like that. This isn't in our outline, but let me let me pop this question on you. I find it very hard to be present after a diabetes alert with whatever I was doing before. So for example, even if I'm having like a pretty serious conversation, I get an alert to calibrate or an alert that my blood sugar is high or low. Immediately, my brain reorganizes priorities to shift the diabetes to the top. Is that mm -hmm. something that, that happens to you as well? Yeah, all the time. And I think that's really hard for people to deal with, like, I th especially like if you are having a hard conversation with someone or, you know, even just in the last meeting, we were just in a diabetics doing things meeting and my blood sugar was low throughout the meeting. And I was just sitting there like I can pay attention, but this is hard, you know, because I think you're just trying to get through the moment and not just through the, the low. Right. And you're also waiting for that because it's really weird. I feel like unless you have diabetes, you don't get it, but it suddenly just lifts. Does that make sense? Like, it's just suddenly like the low goes away and then it's like, oh, sometimes you're back to normal. Sometimes you're not. I think you're the one who told me that some lows take 45 minutes to recover from. So diabetes is always a priority for me all the time. If anything happens and my pump beeps, I'm like, oh, I need to address this immediately because I don't know what it is. And I, I think that's hard for the able to deal with. It's hard for me to deal with. <laughs> I and, you know, I don't know what that says about me, like in, in you know, my recovering ableism, but I, I do think even when it's like a not urgent alert, I, you know, and I think I've just put so much of a focus this year and I've benefit, benefited greatly from forcing myself to be more present in my life and to really, you know, examine what's going on in the moment and appreciating like being in the moment and trying to remember that my life is happening. and. The, and then, you know, I'll sit down, I'll get my, like my central nervous system is all revved up. I'm sitting down to like do some deep work that I'm really excited about. And then I get the calibrate now. And it's like, of course, like right when I get myself situated, diabetes gets in the way. And I think we all experience that in some way, whether it's getting it ready for bed and the low blood sugar coming on from brushing your teeth, or, you know, you're doing something good for yourself, like clean your house. And then you got to, you're sweaty and you got to sit down for 45 minutes mm -hmm. because you got a low blood sugar. I just, I, you know, I, I, I'm happy with my proactivity and ability to take care of myself while at the same time I struggle with my inability to focus completely in the moment without my diabetes being there. And both things are true. You can be present. I'm, I'm really being present with my diabetes in that moment, but it's hard for me to be totally in the flow today as a person who's hyper-connected to their technology managing their diabetes. Then I would be if I didn't have that. And so I, I just am trying to, whether it's, you know, at a show or a concert or a movie or when I'm working or when I'm with Erica and we're having a serious conversation or when I'm with my family or I'm at the dinner table and like all of a sudden I'm on my phone, I'm on my, I'm on my pump, I'm taking gummy bears, I'm testing my blood sugar and I'm not listening to anything that's going on because to me, the priority has now shuffled and diabetes is at the top. And then when I rejoin the conversation, sometimes seconds, sometimes minutes, sometimes much later, I've missed stuff. And, yeah. you know, I think I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be more aware of that as well. And the impact on those around me from, from the diabetes and the diabetes technology. I have a question. Are you, and this is maybe I'm putting on my therapist hat and I don't know, but I didn't even know I had that hat. But anyways, do you feel demotivated? Like, from the low ever like does it ever feel like okay now I don't want to do what I was doing anymore like if you were cleaning and now you're low and sweaty and you have to sit down like I'll just do this a different day like do you ever just like say fuck it yeah yeah all the <laughs> I think like 
and I try not to do that with judgment. Again, like I just kind of growing into the like, can I love myself with a low blood sugar? Yes. But can I acknowledge that I am upset that this low blood sugar, I'm not able to just bounce back immediately from? Yes. Can I advocate for myself in this moment with myself? Like, can I be my, can I be a friend to myself in that moment? Not always. So I think there's opportunity for growth there too. And and again, like this is, you know, kind of woo woo stuff, but I'm a kind of woo woo guy. I realized that all, a lot of the people that I've modeled my life after and, and heroes are all kind of old wizards. <laughs> You know, so you got like Obi Wan Kenobi, you got like Gandalf, you got like Phil Phil Jackson, you got these like old gray, long in the tooth wise men, and like I, that's who I want to be. Like, so I'm kind of like you know this woo woo dude. Makes sense. Good to know that even Rob Howe loses motivation for stuff. Dude, I uh, I would love to tell you that I I wake up every day with a lightning bolt to the heart, ready to get up and kill it. But I I fight those demons. I've been doing, I've done 30 pushups every day for the past like 230 days. I just do it now, but the first five are always the hardest. Yeah. They suck, man. Like, and there's like, ah, oh, not again. And then, you know, 15 comes around, I'm like, all right, cool. Halfway done. And you know, the last 10 are pretty easy, but like getting started is hard. The, the proverb or whatever, a journey of a thousand miles starts with a single yeah. step. It's very true. And most people never start. Most people never start. I think this is a good so I went into what I was going to complain about in this episode. So a, a lot of people already know, but I've been on Manjaro for some time now. And the fact of the matter is that my BMI is too low for a person to be on Manjaro. So this is a medication that is pre- prescribed to people with a certain weight. And the reason that I was taking Manjaro was not necessarily for the weight loss, but was for the insulin sensitivity. Because I just am resistant to insulin. I've been on insulin for 20 plus years. And it's just... Part of life, as such, we were talking about complications. Not a, complica- the, not a complication, a side effect of yeah. taking, you know, other in- exogenous insulin for 20 plus years. And I, I too, like you, both of us, am able-bodied, able-bodied looking, 5'7", or about 145 pounds. So it's just like, Manjaro was making me really, really sick. Point blank, period, right? It's expensive. Insurance does not cover it for type 1s. And it sucks. And it's not for everyone. So today I was having a conversation with my therapist about it because I feel like, and this is a trigger warning, but I feel like the Manjaro has like paired with the diabetes and my history of eating disorder been a terrible, terrible, terrible trifecta because it's something that now allows me to purposefully not eat at all. And when I talk to my doctor about it, she's like, well, let's talk about this weight loss pill. And when I was talking to my therapist today, she was just like, what happened to really prioritizing our physical there, like physical movement and going to the gym and this and that? And I was like, I just don't want to do it. I just, I'm tired. Like diabetes is a lot. My mental feels like there's a lot going on. This year has been very different than where I thought my life was going to be. I just don't want to do it. And she kind of said something that you just said now, which is like, take that first step. It's going to be horrible. Like it's going to suck, but you're going to be so much better for it. And I think I... I'm also trying to be very present with myself and my body and understand that I am not a failure because this medication that works for all of these other people is not working for me. I just need to try the natural insulin sensitivity help- helper, which is physical movement. And I think you're really good at that. You be moving your body all the time, but I don't want to stand up. I want to lay down. Okay? It's so funny. It's so funny you say that because Eric and I were talking about it yesterday. Yeah, dude, I love moving. I hate it, you. <laughs> I like, and I recognize how dumb that is. <laughs> like, I don't know. Like, I'm just so stupid. Like, I'm just such a caveman that if I don't exercise, like, like for two days, like I become like deflated. I don't know. I'm just like not like that's who I am. That's like <laughs> that's my heart. My heart is an exercise. <laughs> I don't know. It's so boring, and I'm lame, but. Like I, and I'm so lucky that that happened to me because my habits and my, what fills my heart is to exert myself and try and like go shoot a basketball. Like you can give me, I could do that every day. God, it was the best. When I, when that was my job, fuck dude, I used to get in, I'd get a thousand shots up a day and like want to do more. I like, I would go just because like, I love that. I love exploring. I love swimming. I love exerting. I love, I love that. That's, that's me. And I'm so fortunate. 
so lucky that that's, you, your, that's what I love parents, to do. Your parents, like, they embedded this chip into your brain. Like, you've got to be a robot where they were like, this is what he's going to be good at. Because it's not, it's not, the rest of us are doing that. Like, the rest, I, and I'm, I don't want to speak for all women, but I know a lot of us who are like, I have to go to the gym. I have to go to the gym. I have to go work out because otherwise I'm going to have to take 42 units of insulin today instead of 36. And it's just like, <laughs> so frustrating. <laughs> I, I am, le- I'm so lucky to have the parents that I had. I, they let me just play by myself outside all day for years. Like, <laughs> They're like, like, I, like I would just be out there shooting baskets till it was dark. When it was dark, I put the light on. You know, I would ride my bike in circles around the cul-de-sac. Uh, you know, uh, run up and down the driveway. I just loved being outside. I would play make believe. I'd play adventures. I would be out in the sun. And I think where it comes down, what it comes down to, and the reason that Erica and I were having this conversation yesterday is, you know, I am like the the podcast morning routine, like MVP. Like I bought the most expensive cold tub. I like buy, I do the athletic greens. I have the the mattress that cools you at night. Like I have like the perfectly optimized human human routine. Because first of all, I love that. But what it has really revealed to me is like everybody says and like the meme accounts are like, get 15 minutes of sunlight directly in your eyes upon waking and then exercise, <laughs> and like do all the crazy stuff. And I love those videos. I really do. But what it really comes down to is the simplest human things. And I think I'm frozen here. And I took a screenshot and I, okay, we're going right, to use it for the episode. It's so good. Please, please do. But I think the, like, they're really simple. And a hundred years ago, 50 years ago, even, they were really easy to do because we weren't working at computers. We were standing up. First thing that we would get woken up by the sun because the alarm clocks, like, like the sun was our boss. We would go out and as long as the sun was up, we would work. And we would be outside, we'd be sweating, we'd be moving our bodies, we'd be drinking water, we'd be eating food from the earth that, you know, didn't have any bad chemicals in it. And now that's not really possible sometimes, you know? So I think the, you know, where we go from here and like, you know, what that looks like is is different and can be different. I'm losing my train of thought, trying to do two things at once, not trying to get the <laughs> camera back. But like, you know, where we go from here, you know, most of the United States is fat. Like most of us are fat. Uh, I think over six, over 60% of us are, you know, clinically obese, uh, considered obese. So that means like more of us and I, I, those people deserve love and visibility and respect. And also we've just built this society that makes it so easy to die, (laughs) you know, like, yeah. You have a couple, it's like, say you've been doing like a, you know, you've been really strict about your diet and exercise for like six months. And then, you know, your job makes you go out of town for a couple of weeks and all you're doing is eating out and you don't have your same exercise routine. And maybe you've gone a long way. I'm, I guess I'm like basically talking about you now, but like, yeah, you know, you're, you're on a jet lag. And so your circadian rhythm is off and you're doing things differently and maybe eating a little bit differently. And all of a sudden you've fallen off the wagon. You know, yeah. you, you're, you know, your your six months of discipline and work is now erased because society is pushing you towards these things that are bad for you. And, you know, so Eric and I were talking about like how lucky I am that I love to exercise and I love to do that. And that fills me up because that's what I'm looking for. And, and you know, I think, you know, back to dopamine and, you know, some people combat addiction with exercise. In that Dopamine Nation book, there's a guy who literally got off a cocaine addiction by by cold plunging. (laughs) So, like, you know, it really is a dopamine issue because it's so easy to get the things that are bad for us. But the things that are good for us and the things that we all want are hard. And so I think that's just the human experience, man. Like, life is pain. And if we're looking for some, like, panacea to make it easy, we're looking for the wrong things and we're going to be disappointed more often than not because it, it just doesn't work that way. And that's not to say that life's not beautiful. It is, but it's hard. And I mean, the great Taylor Swift said life is emotionally abusive. So, man, you know, <laughs> there it is right there. You know, in 4,000 4, weeks, the, the book that I often reference on this podcast. You made me um, read it last year. <laughs> I did. And, and you know, like it, it basically says life is one insoluble problem, one after another, after another, yeah. after another. I mean, you, I mean, this is a stupid Oprah Winfrey quote, but it's like, you deserve to live because you are alive. Right. So, and then while it sounds like very like, duh, it's, 
also like the whole thing about being present and solving those problems and finding it to be a blessing to solve those problems, right? Because the only reason you wouldn't solve the problems is because you are no longer here. So I think I'm, this, we're going a long way to say basically that the diabetes journey is not ending. And even if you do listen to our podcast and you might think that we've got it all figured out, maybe Rob does. I definitely don't. I'm here. I do not. Out, I do not. Just, just like the rest of you guys. And sometimes I'm going to have to try different things, you know, and I think it's interesting that my doctor was ready to prescribe me a weight loss pill immediately. She was just like, okay, Manjaro's not going to work. Let's get you a weight loss pill. And then I talked to my therapist and she was like, actually, if you wanted the pill, do that. But why don't we try going back to what we know works, which is you do like to move your body. You just convinced yourself that you don't want to do it. And you're throwing a grown up tantrum. So put your shoes on and let's get this done. So I, I think we're all struggling with stuff like that. And I think it's just important to talk about. I also think it's important to acknowledge that not everybody has it figured out. You're like, you're talking yeah. about me having it figured out. I do not have it figured out. And I have my tough days and my tough hours and my tough minutes. And I, you know, I think I'm just, I get better at doing things that I don't want to do. I listen to Jocko Willink books and I, I embrace, <laughs> I embrace the suck. I try hard, you know, I, you know, and, and I try not to you know, look at myself with judgment one way or the other. And I know that one workout's not going to solve it. One, you know, month of eating clean or, you know, one month of financial wellness. It's just like the micro decisions day in and day out over a long period of time that, that really have a big impact. So absolutely. Okay. Well, we had some stuff figured out, which is what we're going to talk about next is the mailbag. We are. Before we get to the mailbag, though, I want to drop this last little nugget. We've, we're already over time and I want to spend <laughs> some time with the mailbag. So we have, we're going to announce this month. In June 2023, we're going to announce three events. The first is is open to the public, but is our first event in collaboration with the North Texas Food Bank and the Nudge Pantries in DFW. We're doing an event with some of your favorite diabetes online and diabetes podcast friends of ours called Getting Started with Diabetes. And we're doing that on June 15th with the North Texas Food Bank. It's going to be a virtual event with a panel of amazing folks living with diabetes, just to give a little diabetes education and inspiration to people who really need it. So we're going to have Dex Gerald's, Paloma Kimmick, Glitter Glucose, uh, Neil Greathouse, and Chef Robert Lewis, the happy diabetic, who's going to build a recipe for our attendees based on the ingredients that are going out in the food insecurity kits. So we're going to have a little bit of like tactical conversations about ex exercise and diabetes, finding diabetes community and the importance of it, and then also get into the recipe. So I'm really excited for that. That's going to be recorded. We'll make it available for you guys. Then two more events. One in September is going to be in Denver, Colorado, and that's going to be at the Basketball Social House. More to come on that soon. And then I want to introduce the inaugural Diabetics Doing Things signature event is going to be happening in November. We're talking to the venue already, getting it locked down, and that will be announced soon. It's going to be a pickleball tournament. So get your pickleball teammate together, we're going to have a big day during National Diabetes Awareness Month where we're going to raise a lot of money, awareness, and uh, you know, have an awesome afternoon for people with diabetes. So be on the lookout for that. Now, it's time for the mailbag. Now, Corey, turn the camera on again because <laughs> I wanna, I'm talking to you. You want to get something on this show? You want to find a way to tell your story or ask a question, but you've you know tried to reach out for an interview or we couldn't have the time or whatever the case, email mailbag at diabeticsdoingthings.com. We are monitoring that inbox for this segment. We are reading every single one. If we don't answer them on the air, we will get back to you via email. So mailbag at diabeticsdoingthings.com. Love the intro, first of all, but also I just wanted to give, so there's a couple of people who send emails that aren't questions and I want to give them shout outs because I loved their emails and they were just so real. So this is a special shout out for Philip who wrote you rob an email and the tagline was very much like i have those days where my 770 g my injections do nothing to lower my blood sugar it's terribly frustrating later on in the email he talks a little bit about how he's been having a hard time with his physical well-being just how the winter has been and now things have just been a little bit different but i wanted to tell him that things are okay philip we are reading your email we're thinking about you and give us an update on how your diabetes is going i know that sometimes during the winter which Feels like was so long ago, but was literally not for everyone. It's like a hundred degrees here now, but <laughs> yeah, some, some people still dealing with it. Still dealing with it, but for the just give yourself some grace. I definitely wanted to let him know that, and also thank you for writing in. Also, another shout out to Ollie Rowland for writing in, and Tommy from the Auxilian Podcast. We 
appreciated your emails and definitely we'll be getting back to you guys. Yeah. Tommy Ritz, shout out, dude. The Oxalin, <laughs> Oxalin team. Father, there son, you go. Duo. There you go. There's a specific question. So this was Justice Harris. Shout out to you. He says, Dear Rob and Eritrea, do you have any episodes you've recorded about traveling and managing diabetes? I am in awe of how you travel and have chosen to pause a bit and reset my care. Thank you, Justice. So do we have any episodes like that? And if not, Rob, can you give us some highlights? Yeah, so we definitely have a ton of episodes talking about travel. I think back in the day, I think, you know, we were better about categorizing them a little bit. I think Gretchen Audi, Type 1 Type Happy, her first one, her first podcast way back was about travel. There's an amazing story with Oren Lieberman about he was diagnosed with diabetes on a year long, like sabbatical around the world with his wife. And like he was diagnosed in Nepal and they kept the trip going. I think that was a really cool thing. But Justice, shout out to you, man. I remember you from Chicago, dude. We had an awesome day back in 2019 and just running around Chicago, doing a little photo walk with, with all the folks, I guess 2018, maybe back with all the folks when, when we were there in Chicago. So Shout out to you, man. And I hope your travels are going well. If I remember correctly, you're somewhere overseas. So hopefully you find that reset. But I don't know. My biggest travel tip, if you want to give yours, my biggest tra travel tip is to just take like one and a half times the, 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 the stuff that you would have if you were at home. So I always give a little extra stuff there. That's kind of my just go-to. So before I give you my tips, I'll give you some episodes. So I would say our March episode from this year, episode 226, talks a little bit about my travel to Berlin, stuff like that. There's also an episode from the very beginning of when I started working here that we did with, I think it's Amy Saruda. Is that her name? She has an incredible episode about how she lives in like national parks and does all kinds of awesome stuff with her diabetes that I felt very inspired by before I started traveling so much. So that's oof, a little bit further back, probably like 40 episodes back. But that's a really, really good one for travel tips. Just because I think hers does a really yeah, good job. Of, was, like, I, setting uh, yeah, I, 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 yeah, her episode is really good because it sets you up for possible any type of scenario. Basically, she's ready for it all. And that episode, I remember listening to and be like, I want to be this lady like she is so cool but as far as my travel tips go number one pack your stuff in separate bags i know this sounds counterintuitive but the point is if you lose one bag you will not lose everything do not put all of your insulin eggs in one basket because if that basket goes to hell so does all of your diabetes so i like to split stuff up so i usually have bare minimum supplies and like my backpack that's on my body and then two separate bags one either to carry on or one in a check bag or whatever but I try to split it into three so I used to do just two but now I try to do up to three this actually was what made my was tough for me on when I was a globetrotter because we had like we had to carry on our game bags with our game gear in it because if it got separated and we didn't have our gear like we couldn't play and that you know we we're gonna get paid so I always had my diabetes stuff in there too which made things kind of tricky I had to carry more than the average person. I think that's another thing is you're just going to have to carry more than the average person. Like you said, splitting it up into multiple bags. Mm -hmm. You never know. Somebody else will pick up that bag. That bag will get lost. And if you are dependent on that, you're going to be in trouble. So keep keep that thing on you, as, that, as they say. That's a big one. Another one that I think some people, and I, I'm glad I'm talking about this right now because I had not an argument, but like a small conversation with a friend. Board priority. I do not care. You have a disability. Like I, I remember getting on the plane to go to Alaska and my friend that was with me, we boarded priority. It was a really small plane. And there was another woman who boarded priority with us who was in front of us and she was on crutches. And my friend was like, this makes me feel bad because she actually needs the time. And we don't. Yes, I do, girl. Yes, I do need the time. Yes, I do deserve the time. Just because I look able body does not make me able body. And I, I think it's like, be just because plane. I don't need it today doesn't mean I don't need it at all. Right. right. Also, I need time to put myself on the plane. Also, if you have a, a carry on that you're rolling on, if you're one of the last people to get on the plane, your carry on may not be a carry on, baby. Now it's a checked bag and now you don't have what you need. So I think it's OK to inconvenience other people sometimes for your diabetes. And that's all right. And you should not feel bad about it. Like I, I also saw 
I know that there is a way to like through TSA, there's like TSA cares is like a program you can do to like, you can submit ahead of time to get like a, a voucher or a waiver to go through security a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. But also I saw on a recent post on Instagram, I think Sammy Parker maybe posted it about having a third bag, like a medical bag. Mm -hmm. And she was like, well, how do you, someone asked like, how do you tell them that that's what it's for? And she said, well, on my recent trip, they told me, and I said, no, it's a medical bag. I have type one diabetes. And they didn't question it further. So she doesn't even have to say what she has. She could literally just say this is a medical bag and that's it because HIPAA, baby. So it's just, it's okay to put yourself first, even if sometimes that might make you a little bit uncomfortable. So those are like my two big ones. And then the last one I would say is if you are checking into a hotel and you are by yourself, tell them that you have diabetes. It is important that mm -hmm. the staff knows in case you have an emergency to be aware that you are disclosing to them that you need their support. Needing support is not a bad thing. I'd rather you be in a situation where you have to make a phone call that's a little bit uncomfortable and they already know what to do to help you as opposed to being in a situation where you cannot get access to anything because your hotel bar is empty and the mini bar is closed and they don't want to help you because they don't know what's going on. So yeah. that, that would be the main ones, I think. Oh, and my last one, Julie Heverly taught me this. You can take your pump off at the tech. because So if you were an insulin pump, you have to go through the special one. You can't go through the metal detector. But if you're in a hurry and the metal detector has got a shorter line, you can take your pump off, throw it in your purse, and it can go under the x-ray totally fine. So that's another thing that you can do. If your pump breaks, that's not my fault. Google it. But that's something that I've done before and things that you can do for travel tips. So great question, Justin. And thank you for submitting that to the mailbag. Great. Is that, a, is that our main mailbag for the week? That was our main mailbag of the week. We do have a really, really heavy guest list right now. So do I want to mention that, that we got a few emails from folks who want to come into the pod. If you want to be in the pod, please send it to mailbag at diabeticsdoingthings.com. We will get to your email and throw a question in there because we might just read it aloud on the show and plug you and your your stuff. So that's yeah, you know, I think this is a this is a place to ask for advice, to, uh, to share any of the diabetes drama you're going through. Just hit that mailbag at diabeticsdoingthings.com and we will check it. Thanks for coming to our May episode of the Rob and Eritrea show. I love that I'm getting to close this out. This has been so much fun. We always go over it because we just run our mouths. But that's yeah. that's what we do. June 15th, we're doing that getting getting started with diabetes. Be on the lookout for that. And diabeticsdoingthings.com slash events now heads to our Eventbrite page. So as we're announcing things, keep an eye out there. And as always, thank you guys for listening and subscribing. And we're looking forward to seeing you next month. Maybe a friend's for life. Ha, <laughs>